Hello everyone and welcome to this month's webinar for Total Quilter and My Decorative Quilter. This is month three of our four month quilting project and this month we're doing a wall hanging. It was designed for you by Rita Gazard and presented by myself, Mark Garretts. I'm a National Floriani educator. So as I always like to do before we get started into the project, I like to show you some pictures of where we're headed so you get an idea of what we're trying to construct as we go along. So as I said, this is month three, and this month is a wall hanging. It's at the bottom left there, and you can see above it, last month we did a table runner, and above it we did two pillows in the first month, and in the last month we're going to do this large quilt over on the right, but you can see that these are all coordinated. And finally, here's the picture of the actual wall hanging as it's stitched out, and this will give you a good idea of where we're headed with this project as we go through both the construction details and the software details. So we're going to get started now with the software portion of this project. And there are two sections to the software portion. One is for those of you that own Total Quilter, and the other would be for those of you that still have my Decorative Quilter too. And we are only going to cover in this video the instructions for how to do this project with Total Quilter. If you have my Decorative Quilter, you will want to refer to the printed instructions that you received with the monthly project download. So again, we're going to cover the total quilter section here. Now, the first thing you want to do is go ahead and open your software, obviously. And then if you haven't done it already, come up here to the new file icon and click new to create a new page. And then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to set up our work area so that we are all on the same page, both literally and figuratively. And the way we do that is come up to our ruler bar and hover over it. Now, when I say hover, that means to just hold the mouse over something. And if I want you to do a left click, which is a normal click, I'm just going to say click. And then in these instructions, if I want you to right click, I will tell you to right click, and that means to click with the right mouse button. And then the third type of click that we'll be doing today is a control click. And that means to hold down the control key on your keyboard and then click the mouse simultaneously. So again, just a standard click is just a click. I'm going to say click. If I want you to right click, I will say right click. And if I want you to control click, I will say control click. So go ahead and hover over the ruler anywhere along the top ruler and then go ahead and right click. And when you do that, a little dialog box will come up and this is where we're going to set our grid settings. Now, first of all, you should be in inches mode, so inches should be checked. So if you're in metric, switch to inches. You should also have show grid checked, snap to grid checked, and snap to anchors checked. Now, in the written instructions, it tells you to also check snap to guidelines. Really doesn't matter if you check that or not, because we are not going to use any guidelines, so there's nothing to snap to. But if it's on or off, it doesn't matter. And lastly, you want to come down and click grid settings. And this is where we're going to set our grid settings. And our horizontal grid spacing wants to be set to 3.375 inches. You want your vertical grid spacing to be set to 5 inches. You want your grid major, both horizontally and vertically, both to be set to 1. So that means we're going to get a grid major line for every one of these grid minor lines over here. And the rest of these you can leave the way they are and go ahead and click OK to lock those changes in. When you do that, your screen should look something like this. The next thing we're going to do is select our thread chart. And to do that, what you want to do is come down here and click the Select Thread Chart icon at the lower left hand corner. And what you want to select is Floriani Cotton. Now, we won't actually be using Floriani Cotton Thread when we stitch out this design. In fact, what we want you to use is Quilter Select Thread, but we're using Floriani Cotton here because there's only a few colors and it makes it a lot easier to choose from the colors in our color palette here, which are not distracted by hundreds of colors. So that's the reason we are using Floriani Cotton. The next thing we want to do is we want to load in our artwork block so that we can trace over the top of it to create an Appliquilt block. And we could do this either with an image file, which is a raster file, also known as a JPEG or a TIFF or a PNG or a GIF or something like that. But 
we can also use a vector file, which would be like an SVG file or an FCM file or something like that to trace over as well. And that's in fact what we're going to do for this quilt and what we're doing for this whole project. So what you want to do is you want to come up to your file menu and you want to click the import artwork icon there. And you'll want to navigate to your May 2017 project folder and I'll show you where that is. It's going to be in C Floriani Designs, MDQ Project, May, and then May 2017. So all the way down here in May 2017, click that to open up that folder. And in there you will see two artwork files. One will be a wall hanging block FTQ, that's for Floriani Total Quilter, and MDQ version for those of you that have my decorative quilter. Since we're doing the Total Quilter version, you want to click on that one and you want to go ahead and click open. And when you do that, you will see that we have this artwork block that comes in that represents the pieces of our quilt block. Now what we're actually going to do is we're going to convert this into an apple quilt block because that's the construction method that we're going to use to put this wall hanging together. So the way we do that is we come up here to our create apple quilt block icon, which is this purple icon right here, and go ahead and click that. And when you do that, you'll see that your cursor changes into a crosshair with a little rectangular box by it. And that's telling us that we first need to draw the outline of our quilt block. And we're going to do that by clicking and dragging a rectangle. And we're going to start up here in this corner and drag down to this corner down here. And since we have snap to uh, grid turned on, our quilt block is aligned perfectly with these grid lines and it's going to make a perfect outline for us. So I'm just going to click up here and drag down to the lower right hand corner. Because I have snap to grid turned on, I don't need to get really precise. I just need to get fairly close to the point I want. And when I let off the mouse, you can see that it's going to snap that rectangle into perfect position. Now what the software wants me to do is trace over the top of these lines here to bisect our outline into the various pieces. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to use these anchor points here, which are the anchor points that are defined in that SVG file as a way to easily trace these outlines. And that's the reason that we have snap to anchors turned on so we can easily do that. Now, as we do this, we're going to be doing two different kinds of clicking. One will be just a normal left click and the other will be a control click. And the difference is that if we left click, it puts in a straight line point. And if we control click, it puts in a curved line point. So here's the way we're going to do it. Every place we have a curved line like this area right here, we're going to control click around it. But every place we have a sharp point, like say right in here, we are going to click a curved point when we get to that sharp point. But to tell the software we want this to be a sharp point, the next point we click is going to be a regular left click. And so in this case right here, we're going to do a control click here. But here on the next point, we would do a regular left click to tell it this was a sharp point. But this is also a sharp point. So our next point is also going to be a regular left click and then we'll go back to control clicks to complete it. So what we're going to do is we're going to start up here and work our way around this element first and then come down here and work our way around as much as possible. And since this element here that we need to do is all curved lines, we're going to control click all the way around it. So I'm going to hover over this node right here. And again, because I have snap to anchors turned on, I don't have to get super close to this. So I can just get pretty close to it and I'm going to hold down control and click. I'm going to do another control click, control click, control click at each one of these blue squares. And when I get down to the bottom one, I need to press the enter key to tell it that I'm done entering that particular bisecting line. Now I'm going to move on to the next one, which is this one. And again, I'm going to start out with a control click. And since these are all curved, I'm going to control click around and I'm going to continue to control click on this last point here. Now, since this is a sharp point, remember our rule, we follow a sharp point with a regular left click. 
Again, another sharp point, so we're going to follow it with a regular left click, and then I'm going to hold down Control and click these last two points and press Enter to tell it that I'm done. And then I'm going to come down here and we're going to start. We're going to go all the way around this one. So we're going to do Control click, Control click, Control click, Control click, Control click, Control click, left click. Remember, another sharp point, so another left click. Now a control click, control click, sharp point. So a regular left click, control click, control click, sharp point. So we're going to do a left click, left click, and control clicks all the way down to the bottom. And we're going to press Enter to tell it that we're done. Now we're going to move down to this point here. And again, we're going to control click on these curved points here. And we're going to again follow this with a regular left click and another left click, then control, control click, control click, control click, enter to tell it that I'm done. We're going to move down to this circle. These are all going to be control clicks around here. So I'm control clicking all the way around until I get to the last point. Then I'm going to press enter to tell it that I'm done. Just two more to go. So what we're going to do is we have a choice here. We could either do this bisecting line or this one. So let's go ahead and do this one first. And we're going to start at the top and I'm going to control click all the way around this one because again it's all curved points. So I'm just going to control click around it all the way. And when I get to here I'm going to press enter to tell that I'm done. And then the last one I'm going to start out here. And these since it's all straight I can just do a left click and a left click and then enter to tell that I'm done. And I've now put all my bisecting lines in. So to tell Total Quilter that I'm done creating this Apple Quilt block, all I need to do now is right click on my mouse. And when I do that, you'll see that it'll recreate this block and it's going to slice it up in all the perfect sections here. So the next thing we need to do after we've done that is we need to start decorating this block and adding stitches and things. So the way we're going to do that is we're first going to put in some decorative stitching in this semicircle here. Now this is optional. You don't have to do this if you want, but we think the quilt looks better at, if you do it. The way we manipulate these sections is with a special selection tool right here called our Appliquilt Object Selection Tool. So we're going to go ahead and click that. Before I do, you'll notice that my regular selection tool is highlighted. When I click this one, the highlight will go away over here, but it'll highlight this selection mode instead to remind us that we're now going to select the parts and pieces of blocks. And so what I'm going to do is select somewhere inside this semicircle here and we're going to assign some decorative quilting stitches here. And to do that we're going to come down here to our advanced stippling icon and click that. And it's going to bring up this window and we're going to select stipple pattern number 10 to go in there. And it's going to come in very very tight and we're going to change that to something much more loose, which will go with the quilt a lot better. So to control that, we do that with our pattern size over here. And what we want to put in is actually 15.9 millimeters. So that's what I'm typing on my keyboard. And I'm going to click Apply. Remember, nothing happens over here when you change things over here until you click the Apply button. And you can see now that I've, got, I've done that, I've got a decorative stitch pattern in here. So the very next thing we need to do is we need to apply our um, tack down lines, our Appliquilt binding uh, stitches to these lines. And so the way we're going to do that is we are going to make sure we're still in Appliquilt object selection mode, which we are. And we're going to click all of our lines here. And we're going to select the first line here. And to select the remainder of them, we're going to hold down the control key on my keyboard. So I'm going to be control clicking all of these lines. Now it doesn't matter which order you do them in, but I'm just going to kind of go around clockwise here and select them all. So these are all the lines. You can see they're all highlighted in yellow. Now to turn these into a motif stitch, I come down here to my motif stitch icon and click it. And that's going to put a motif in. The default is going to be 205, but what we want is pattern number 247. So we're going to scroll down until we see that. So here it is right here. So I'm going to go ahead and click that. This pattern size of 15 millimeters is way too big. What we want instead is a pattern size of 6 millimeters. So I'm going to put in a 6 here 
and I'm going to leave the rest of these parameters alone and click apply and you can now see that I've got a nice motif in here. Now the very next thing we need to do is once we've done this we're going to export this block to generate our cut files. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to come up here to this icon which is our export Appliquilt block but before we do that we are going to um, click on the block which is this item right here. So we're going to select it to make sure that the entire block is selected. Then we're going to come up here and click this export Appliquilt block icon and where it says project name we're going to type over that. We're going to put in wall hanging project and we're going to leave it in the default project folder which is Floriani Designs Appliquilt. You can change it if you want. You want to leave your seam allowance to that quarter of an inch. Uh, you will definitely want to check stitch files and here in file format you will want to choose your file format. So I happen to have a baby lock multi needle so I'm going to leave it at baby lock multi needle PES version 9 but if you have something different you want to click the down arrow and select the machine format here that matches your stitch file format. If you want to, you can save the stitch files as a WAF file, but you definitely would like to click as digitized. And what that does is it changes the sequence from what the program thinks is the optimal sequence. Instead, it's going to follow the sequence that we followed and it's going to keep the program from making its own decisions about it. So if you have a digital cutter, you'll want to check cut files and you can choose your file format. For just about every digital cutter, you can use an SVG format, which is the default. But if you happen to have a brother scan and cut, you can click the drop down and choose the FCM file format, which is the file format you would like for your brother scan and cut. So we'll go ahead and leave it. Uh, no, I'm going to go ahead and change it back to SVG. And uh, you can set your page size if you want. And here you can tell it to import files and or save them as WAF files. So this is going to save your uh, cut files as WAF files if you check this box, which I will. And it will also, if you check this import files, immediately open up these WAF files in Total Quilter so that you can manipulate them if you want or merge the files together to get a better page layout or whatever you like. And if you have a manual cutter, you'll want to click here for manual cutting and click preview and then go ahead and print out your design template so you can cut your pieces out manually. And lastly, you'll want to go ahead and click export and that is going to go ahead and export them into that folder. And it's going to go ahead and open up the folder where we saved it and you can see here's our WAF file of the project, here's our stitch file, and here are our various cut files that we need for this. And what I'm going to do is just go ahead and close this because we're going to move on to the second part of this project and that is adjusting the stitch file to get it to do the things that we want. So to do that we're going to come up here to our open icon and go ahead and click that and you're going to want to navigate back to this wall hanging project folder and what you want to open up is the stitches file that you generated not the WA file but the stitches file so go ahead and click that and click open and when you do that, it's going to bring in the stitches file. And you'll notice that sometimes it doesn't align the grid perfectly. And you'll see that the grid doesn't align to this block anymore. Uh, we really don't need it to do that for this particular exercise here. But to get it to do it, all you need to do is right click on your ruler, click grid settings, and then just simply click OK. Don't change anything. And you'll see that it snaps the grid back into the right place. So here you can see the stitches that we have generated for this file. And the very first thing that we want to do is we want to get some, get rid of some of the stitches that we don't need. So what we're going to do is come over here to this first item in our sequence view and click this little plus right here to expand it and then click on the first run which is the outside rectangle there and we actually don't need that run stitch so we're going to delete it. Now you have several ways you can delete it. You can right click on it and choose delete. You can come over here and click the scissors icon 
or you can use the delete key on your keyboard to delete it. So I'm just going to go ahead and click delete here since I have that open, but you can delete it any way that you like. The next thing we want to do is we want to go ahead and collapse this item so it looks a little smaller. So we're going to do that by clicking on the minus sign there. And then what we want to do is select this last item and we actually need three copies of it. So what we're going to do is select it and we're going to click the copy icon up here and then we're going to paste it two more times. So I'm going to click paste and paste and when you see that I've now got three run stitches over here. Now we're going to use these as the outline for the place to put down our batting and then to tack the batting down and then finally to become part of our skeleton to show us where we're going to place down our cut pieces. So we want this to stitch out first and the way we're going to do that is select it and then we're going to drag it up to the top so it's touching all items here and let off the mouse and you'll see that it comes all to the top here. Now what we want to do is we want to just select the second one of these, so the middle one, and we're going to change its thread color. And the reason we're going to do that is because, like I said, we want this first run to be a placement line, and we want the machine to stop. So if we left it the same color, it would just continue on and stitch it again. So we're going to change the thread color, and it doesn't really matter what you change it to, but I'm going to select this cotton wine color here, 22, in our thread palette. So I'm going to go ahead and select that. And you'll see now it separates it out. So we've got three separate items here, alternating thread colors, so that this will stitch, the machine will stop, then this will stitch, the machine will stop, and then this one will stitch. Now we actually don't want a run stitch here. We want kind of a tack down stitch to tack our batting down. So we're going to come up here to our run type and change from a single run to one of our Appliquilt binding motifs. And these are our special Appliquilt binding stitches that you get in Total Quilter for doing Appliquilt binding. We're not actually using it for that in this particular instance, but we just wanted to show it to you. So I'm going to come down here and click Appliquilt 00, which is the cross pattern. And we're going to leave our stitch length at 4, but instead of leaving our run spacing at 0, we don't need this to be quite this tight, so we are going to set it to 4 as well. So instead of doing cross-cross, it's going to put like a 4 millimeter space in between here, and so it's going to give us fewer crossing stitches like this, just to make it a little bit easier to sew down and tack down, because we really don't need it to be that tight. So I'm going to go ahead and click Apply, and when I do that, you'll see that we've got our tack down pattern in over here. And then the next thing what we want to do is we want to eliminate the stop between this gunmetal gray and this gunmetal gray here. So right now the machine would stitch this and most machines would stop in between here even though it's the same color. So the quick and dirty way to get rid of that is to select both of them. So I'm going to hold down uh, I'm going to click the first one and hold down control and click the second one. And then what I'm going to do is reassign it to that same color, which is this color right here, number one in our sequence view. So if I just go ahead and click on that color, it reassigns them all to the same color. And now you see I've got a nice pattern that represents everything. So the next thing we're going to do is we are going to align this particular set of advanced stippling stitches to the center of the block. So to do that, I'm going to zoom in and you might want to do this as well. So I'm going to click my magnifying glass here and I'm going to drag a box around this area and you can see now, now don't forget to come back and click your normal select tool. Um, you can see that the center line stitches here of this pattern don't line up exactly with the center of our block. So when we put the second block together with it over here, when we stitch that out and stitch them together, this would have a little jump here in this center stitch and that circles wouldn't line up. So to eliminate that, we're actually going to click on this item right here. So we're going to click on it to select it and then we're going to drag it down so that this line lines up with this grid line here. And so I'm going to click and drag it down so that it lines up with that grid line. And when I get it on top, I will be in the perfect position now to go ahead and stitch that out so that when these both sides stitch out, they will line up. 
So the last thing we need to do is add in our quilting stitches to this, our linear quilting file. Now we created this in the very, very first project and it's going to be the same for this one. So rather than recreate it every time, what we're going to do is we're just going to open it up and actually merge it into this stitch file. And the way we do that is we come up here to the file icon and we click merge stitch file. And when we do that, it's going to go to the last directory where we were working, which is our wall hanging project. And that's not where it is. So we're going to click the down arrow here and we're going to go back up to Appliquilt to the master directory. You could also do that with this up arrow here. And what we're going to do is go to the very, very first project, which was the pillow project. And here is your linear quilting, which we created in that project. And we're going to go ahead and click open. So we've selected it. And when we do that, you can see it pops in down here out of the way of this one. Now, what we really want to happen is we want this to be on top of this and be perfectly aligned. So the way we're going to do that is select this set of stitches over here. And we're going to use our alignment tools to align them automatically. And when we brought this stitch file in, it aligned automatically to the zero, zero point on our design page. So we're going to move this one to that same point by coming, coming up here and clicking our alignment icon and click the next to last one, which is center to rulers. And so that's going to center it perfectly over this design. Now all I need to do is double click it so you can see. I mean, I double click my magnifying glass so you can see this whole design here. And that's all we need to do to complete this stitch file. So all we need to do now is save this project and we want to definitely save it as a stitch file so we can stitch it out. And you also have the option of saving it as a WAF file as well. So let's go ahead and save the stitch file first. So I'm going to come up here to file and click save as, which is right here. And you'll see it goes back to our wall hanging project. I don't see the stitch file here because down here I've set to WAF. So if I change it to PES version 9, which is what I'm going to save it to. You'll see there's my stitch file again. I'm just going to save it right over the top of this by selecting it again. And when I click save, it's going to give me a warning saying that this already exists. Do I want to replace it? Yes, I do. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And then I'm also going to save it as my WAF file. So I'm going to come up here and say file, save as again. And this time it's going to try and save it as a WAF file. I don't have one of those yet. So if I click save, it's just going to save it in the WAF format. So now I have both. And that completes the software section of this project. So we're going to start with the construction details of this project now. And to begin, let's go over the materials that you require for this project. First, you're going to want to get some Floriani embroidery batting. You'll need some Floriani nylon no-shell mesh stabilizer. You want the non-fusible kind and the color does not matter. You'll want to get some Floriani Applique Wonder or Quilter Select Applistick. Either one you pick, you want some rolls or sheets of it, and you'll also want some quarter inch tape version of it. And then for thread, we prefer that you use Quilter Select Perfect Cotton Plus for the top thread and Quilter Select Para Cotton Poly for the bobbin thread. And you'll want to choose colors that work well with your fabric choices, including the bobbin thread. You'll also want to have some wet and gone tacky tape in the one inch width. You'll need a seven and a half by 10 inch or 185 by 260 millimeter or larger hoop size. Now, if you don't have a machine that can stitch that size, you can reduce the designs for a smaller hoop, but the projects and fabric requirements will be smaller, obviously. And lastly, having a walking foot and a joining, also known as a stitch in the ditch foot, would be helpful. In terms of the fabric details, you're going to want some light colored fabric, five and a half yards of that, medium colored fabric, two and a half yards, dark colored fabric, three and three quarter yards. For the mock binding fabric, you want two and a half yards, and for the backing, you'll need five and a half yards. Before you panic, the fabric quantities listed above are for all four of the projects, not just this one this month. And the fabric yardage is also fairly generous to account for different cutting techniques. But for complete details about the fabrics, you'll want to see the project overview that you got in the February 2017 project folder. So that came in your February 2017 project download. 
So the next step is to prepare your fabric and you'll want to refer to the second page of the overview section again that was downloaded in the February 2017 project folder and you'll want to cut out your fabric shapes together with the applique wonder or the apple stick that you'll fuse to the back first according to the wall hanging column in that overview and you'll use either a digital cutter to do that or you can use the templates that were provided in this month's project files if you're cutting them by hand. In addition to the above shapes, you're also going to want to cut from the light fabric two one and a half inch by 28 and a half inch strips. From the dark fabric, also cut two three and a quarter by 29 inch strips, two five and a quarter by 28 inch strips. And from the Floriani embroidery batting, you want to cut eight six and three quarter by 10 inch sections, and you want to cut those quite precisely. You'll also need two two inch by 21 inch and two four inch by 32 inch strips of the batting. And finally, you want to cut eight sections of the no-show mesh about two inches larger all the way around than your hoop size. Now, before we start embroidering, it's important to note that most of the color changes in this design are there simply to make the machine stop between the steps. And that's so we can put our batting and fabric pieces, etc., down. And you have the option of leaving the same thread in all the way along, or you can change it as desired. But if you have a multi-needle machine, it's important that you use the machine controls to insert the stop commands to make the machine stop between colors, and that will keep it from zooming on and stitching the next color and not stopping. So now we're going to start embroidering the design. So the first thing you want to do is load the wall hanging design that you put on your stick into your machine. Hoop up a piece of Floriani nylon no-show mesh, get it nice and tight. Attach the hoop to the machine and stitch out the first color, which will become the placement line for our batting. Next, you'll want to center the batting within the placement lines and gently hold the batting in place during stitching and a stiletto or chopstick or something is good for doing this. Do, please don't use your fingers. And then you want to go ahead and stitch the next color to tack down the batting. Now once it starts stitching, you can take the stiletto or the chopstick away. Next, you want to go ahead and stitch out the next color, which will be the placement lines, also known as the skeleton, which will show us where to place our shapes down on top of the batting. Next, you'll want to peel the backing paper off of the shapes that you've cut out and then carefully place those shapes within those placement lines that we stitched out. And then you can either finger press or use a small iron to better press them to secure them into place. You can now change the upper thread if you want for the decorative stitches because that's what we're going to stitch out next is that optional decorative stitching. So go ahead and stitch that out if desired. Once again, you can change the upper thread now if desired because the next color we're going to stitch out will be the binding or cover stitches that tack our fabric down. And finally, change the upper thread one more time if you want because the next color is going to be for the quilting stitches. So we're going to go ahead and stitch those stitches out. So now you'll want to stitch seven more blocks just like the one we did for a total of eight sections. And you want to make four of each block as shown. Half have the light fabric on the top and the other half have it on the bottom. Once you have all your blocks stitched out, you want to trim them from the back side, leaving a quarter inch seam allowance outside the seam line. Next, you'll want to set out your blocks in two rows as shown in the diagram here. In row one, you want to sew block A to block B using a quarter inch seam allowance and press the seam open. Then repeat that by sewing C to D. Then finally sew the two sections you just made, your A, B, and C, D sections together, again using a quarter inch seam allowance and press open. And repeat that for row two. And then finally, you want to sew row one to row two, again with a quarter inch seam allowance, press open. And then you want to trim the whole thing to square it up. Now that we have our base quilt done, we're going to add the borders to it. So you want to butt a two inch batting strip against the top side and then optionally tape it to the quilt with wet and gone tacky tape. And then you want to attach the two with a joining stitch. 
Repeat that for the bottom sides and then trim the ends flush with the long sides of the quilt. Then you want to repeat for the other sides using the 4 inch batting strips this time and then trim it flush again. Next we're going to add the last pieces of fabric for our borders and backing material. And I just want to note that the method for adding the borders and finishing up this project is the same regardless of the project size. So we're going to use the table runner example from last month. And that's what the pictures are. The procedures are the same. You'll just have to use your bigger wall hanging. So first you want to place one long light fabric strip right side down along the top edge of the quilt and sew it with a quarter inch seam allowance and repeat for the bottom side and then press that open. So next you'll want to place one short light fabric strip right side down along a short edge of the quilt and sew it down with a quarter inch seam allowance. Repeat it for the opposite side and then press both of those open. Now on all four sides you want to draw a line on the side strips three quarters of an inch away from the seam lines. And the seam lines are shown here in the picture with the red arrows. So you're going to have a square of lines three quarter inch outside the edge of the inner quilt. Next you'll want to place one long dark fabric strip right side down with the raw edge along the top edge of the lines we just drew and sew with a quarter inch seam allowance. Repeat for the bottom side and press that open. Now place a short dark fabric strip right side down along the drawn line along the short edges and then sew with a quarter inch seam allowance. Repeat for the opposite side and press both of those open. Next you'll want to measure your quilt and then cut a section of your backing fabric one inch larger than the quilt on all sides. Place the backing fabric right side down on a flat surface and center the quilt on the backing right side up. You can go ahead and pin it in a few places if you want and then stitch in the ditch around the edge of each block to secure the backing to the quilt. Now we want to fold our side borders towards the center to move them out of the way and then trim the batting and the backing fabric together three and a half inches away from the seam line on both sides. Now like we did for the sides, we want to fold the top and bottom borders towards the center to move them out of the way. Then trim the batting and the backing fabric together, this time one and a half inches away from the seam line on both sides. Next you'll want to open out all the borders and press them open and then flip the quilt upside down. And from now on we're going to be looking at the back of the quilt. Now you'll want to fold the top border fabric in half to meet the edge of the quilt and then go ahead and press that. Next you'll want to fold that side in again firmly covering the back by about three quarters of an inch and press it. Then you want to open it out and press one quarter inch applique wonder tape to the underside of the border piece that we just folded out. It's important that the tape should not extend past the seam lines shown here with the red arrows. Then you want to remove the release paper and then fold it back over and finger press it in place and repeat it on the bottom side. When you're finished doing the previous step, the side ends should look like this. Next we're going to trim out some of our border to reduce bulk. And what we're going to do is trim out a rectangle here shown in red in the corner. And what you want to do is cut up along the seam line, but you want to leave about a quarter inch folded over and that's all you need. So the diagram on the right shows you kind of what you will end up with. Now we're going to create our mock miter by folding the short side in at about a 45 degree angle at the corner there. You want to leave about a 1 8 inch gap when folding it in. Press it in place and repeat for the remaining corners. Now to finish up our mock miter here, you want to fold the border into the edge of the quilt, leaving a slight gap, and then fold it in again firmly over the back of the quilt. And then you want to repeat for the opposite side. And remember that we're only folding in the two short borders in order to create this mock miter. Then you want to secure the edges and the mock miter with your quarter inch applique wonder tape like we did on the long sides. 
Again, it's important to note here that you're only going to be doing this on the short, fat sides of this, not on the long sides, in order to create our mock miter. To finish up our quilt, you'll want to stitch in the ditch between the light and the dark borders, and we recommend that you use Quilter Select 60 weight thread that blends well with the background fabric. And for a more finished look, you might want to mimic the quilting lines in the borders as shown here in red, or you can use your own fun way to quilt the borders. So that completes our project for this month. We want to thank you all for attending and watching this video. We hope you'll use this video along with the printed PDF instructions to recreate this project at home. And again, come back next month for the last project in this series of four.